In this tutorial, I'm going to cover how to emulate the Sony PlayStation on your Mac, and not only just emulate it, but improve your gaming experience beyond what the original console ever offered. There's quite a bit of ground to cover, so let's get to it. There are multiple options to emulate the PlayStation on a Mac, including even on PowerPC Macs with the Kinetics Virtual Game Station. I even made a video about the history of that. While emulators like OpenEMU do a reasonable job of emulating the PlayStation, it just doesn't have the advanced graphical features of DuckStation. You can experience PlayStation tiles at 4K and widescreen with texture smoothing and faster load times. This tutorial will explore the many features of DuckStation. Let's get started. Your time's pretty valuable, so I'm going to move fast, so just use the playhead and skip around with the chapters. First, go to the official website on duckstation.org. As of recording this video, you'll have to click Other Platforms for the Mac. Other platforms should redirect you to their GitHub page with the latest release. Scroll down and download the Mac release. At the top of this page, if you click Releases, you can see previous versions of DuckStation. This is important to keep in mind in case there is a bad release which has random crashing. You can always get the older version here. Now that we've downloaded the application, we can decompress it. I am going to move it into my Applications folder. Now, if you were to double-click the app, you'll probably see DuckStation cannot be open because the developer cannot be verified. This is very common for open-source software because the developer has not paid for an Apple account. Instead, what we'll do is right-click the application, then click Open. This will whitelist the application so you can run it in the future without this message. The first screen will be the language and theme. I'm an English speaker and the Dark Fusion theme is fine. I'll click Next. The next screen is for the BIOS. In case you're wondering, the PlayStation BIOS is firmware built into the console that initializes and manages hardware components and provides runtime services for games and programs. Use your own moral compass here. I personally own a PlayStation, so that's my vindication. Places like archive.org are a good place to look for them. DuckStation requires multiple BIOS for Japan, US and Canada, and Europe for it to function. You can install these wherever you would like. I'm placing mine into the user directory. In DuckStation, click Browse and navigate to where you place your BIOS. Click Next. I have a folder with a collection of games in it, so I'll add this to my games directory library. Since this directory has folders inside of it, I want to say yes to scan recursively. Games are often ripped in binq, .ecm, and ISO, and all of these are compatible with DuckStation. You can make ISOs from your own CDs using the disk utility on the Mac. As always, please don't ask me where to download games as they are copyrighted. The next thing I'll want to do is set up a controller. The PlayStation has several controller options. Since my controller is a PlayStation 4 controller, I'll be using the analog controller. There are tutorials on how to connect PlayStation controllers wirelessly, but I'm going to be using the easiest method, which is just plugging it in via USB. I'm going to click Automatic Mapping and select my plugged-in controller. Then click Next and Finish. At this point, if you have a games directory, it'll start scanning it. From the view, I'm going to select Toolbar. I personally prefer having this here. Before we move on, let's talk about controllers for just a second more. I'm going to click controllers from the toolbar. Using automatic mapping, you can automatically bind the controller buttons, but if for some reason you cannot use automatic mapping or wish to change the button layout, you can manually map the controller buttons. I'll quickly demonstrate how this is done. I'm going to go over to the up button and click it. Now I'm going to tap up on my D-pad on my controller. You would need to repeat this process for every button on the PlayStation controller. I'm sure the majority of people watching this already know, but the PlayStation did not ship with a DualShock style controller. Some games like Ape Escape require the DualShock styled analog controller. Speaking of Ape Escape, let's close out and launch this game. When you first launch a game, you may see the compiling pipelines. Compiling pipelines refers to the process of translating and optimizing the PlayStation's graphics pipeline into a form that can be executed efficiently on modern hardware, ensuring for the accurate and fast emulation of games. It can take a while, and when you change graphics settings, it'll have to recompile these. Ape Escape is running, and it doesn't look great. I'm going to hit spacebar to pause the emulation, and then exit out of full screen. From the settings dropdown, I'm going to select graphics. The first thing I'll want to do is change the internal resolution. I'm going to select 4K as my monitor is 4K. DuckStation will now have to recompile its pipelines. Now this is an important quirk of DuckStation. If you remember, I hit spacebar to freeze the emulation. It looks like compiling pipelines is stuck. 
What I need to do is hit spacebar again and it'll continue emulating. We can see that polygons are rendering much sharper, but the textures look very pixelated. What I'm going to do is go back to the graphics and select texture filtering. I want to use XBR for the texture filtering. Increasing the internal resolution as well as texture filtering will increase the burden on the GPU. On older Macs, you may have to use different internal resolutions and texture filtering, otherwise the frame rate may be pretty bad. With XBR, we can now see that textures are really smoothed out. Also, it has a bit of a wobbly look. If you notice, there are huge black bars on the sides of the picture. That is because the PlayStation was designed for old 4x3 CRTs. Let's head back to the graphics options. To reduce the wobbliness in the polygons, let's check PGXP Geometry Correction. This works on most games, but not all games. Next, I'm going to check widescreen rendering. Then under aspect ratio, I'm going to select 16 by 9. For me personally, the game is looking surprisingly good. Just keep in mind, this is all personal preference, so you can run these settings however you see fit. I almost forgot there's a PGXP tab in the graphics settings. PGXP being the Parallel Perspective Correction Graphics Extension. It aims to correct geometry distortions and texture warping commonly seen in PlayStation games due to the console's lack of a floating point precision in vertex calculations. In order for any of these advanced options to have any effect, PGXP geometry correction must be enabled. The two I'm going to check are perspective correct textures and culling correction. Feel free to play with some of these options, but remember some of these may have negative effects in some titles. Next, let's look at the post-processing menu. Post-processing are effects that you can apply to the rendered image. Make sure enable post-processing is checked then I'm going to click Add, and I'm going to select CRT New Pixie. Immediately, we can see that it's simulating a CRT. We can chain multiple post-processing effects together. I'm going to add film grain to it, too. We can adjust the settings for each post-processing effect below. I don't know if you'll be able to see this in YouTube, but I can definitely see the film grain. Feel free to explore the various post-processing effects. Now let's look at a 2D title like Mortal Kombat Trilogy. In graphics, we skipped over downsampling, so let's have a look at that. We can configure Duck Station for individual games, so let's go to Game Properties. Let's say I don't like the way this looks, and I'm going to change the graphics just for this game. If you notice, most of the settings say Use the Global Settings. This is the default setting that I configured earlier. Since this is a 2D game, it is not being rendered at 16x9. Unfortunately, the only thing we can do for this title is stretch the image, and it doesn't look great. Let's change that back before we move on. If you noticed earlier, I passed over the setting downsampling. That is because it's largely beneficial for 2D games. This game is a 2D title, so let's look at it. Let's change the downsampling, which is used primarily for 2D games. Right now it's disabled, but I am going to select box. Immediately we can see the image is more pixelated. I'm going to change the downsampling ratio. Increasing this will smooth out the image. Now you may have noticed when I hit 2x it did nothing. That is because the internal resolution must be cleanly divisible by the downsampling ratio. Alright, let's leave it at 3x. If we go down to scaling, we can change the type of algorithm that's using the scale to image. You can see the effects in real time. I'm going to leave this on bilinear sharp. Using the setting, we can see the edges are just a bit more pixelated. And here it is in action. The difference here is pretty subtle, but it should look just a little bit more crisp since we reduce some of the smoothing effects. The next time I launch this game, it will use these settings and not my global settings. Let's look at some more ways to improve emulation. This time I'm using the title Bushido Blade 2. In a game like this, reaction times are everything, but we can slow down the emulation. In the settings, we'll go to Game Properties, and then give me a second while I move my window, and then we're going to select Emulation. In the settings, we'll go to the tab Emulation, and then we will adjust the emulation speed to 50%. Here we can see the real-time effect of 50% emulation, the characters are moving very slowly. Also in the emulation tab is the all-important vertical sync or v-sync, and this will help prevent the effect that is known as tearing. I am not going to go over all the v-sync options, the descriptions below tell you quite a bit. Now let's use some speed hacks that can help load times. This time I'm launching NBA Hang Time, I'm going to go to Game Properties, and then select the console tab. What we're going to do is change the CD-ROM emulation speeds. It probably doesn't need to be said with my general audience, but hard drives and SSDs are a lot faster than CD-ROM drives. 
you'll want to do this on the game properties and not the global settings because this is definitely not compatible with every single title. We are going to crank up both the read speed up and the seek speed up to their maximums. This will only marginally speed up your load times because of the limitations of the PlayStation CPU and its RAM. And the game does load a little bit faster. NBA Hang Time is compatible with this feature. Let's talk about memory cards for a second. Go to settings and to memory card. The default is probably going to be something that most people won't need to mess with. It is set to separate card per game. This means that it creates an individual memory card for each game you launch. There might be edge cases where you don't want this, so if you click on the tab, you can create a memory card that is shared between all games. Let's leave it at separate game per title. Now let's look at shared settings. Let's click the open button near the memory card directory. We can see where all of our .mcds or our virtual memory cards are stored. Let's take a look at memory card editing as you can download game saves off the internet. Click memory card editor. Then from the drop down, we can select which memory card we want to edit. I have selected NBA hang time. I will highlight my game save and export it to my desktop. I can also delete my game save from this screen. Highlight the save you'd like to delete and then click delete file. Select the deleted file a second time and click delete to permanently delete the file. Let's import that game save that I just exported. Click import file because this is a single file and not a card. Locate the single save file and then click open. I have now just imported my game save. Now when I close this window, it'll ask me if I want to save my changes and I'm going to click yes. Now let's look at on-screen display. Go to the graphics settings, then under the tabs, select OSD. We can display a bunch of statistics about how well our game is emulating. I'm going to check show emulation speed, show FPS, and show GPU usage. Now when we play a game, we can see these statistics printed on screen. This can be useful information when you're trying to fine tune your graphic settings. Your target should always be 100% of the emulation speed. Personally, I like the game list view, but some people prefer a different view. If we go under view, we can go to game grid. Right now, it's not populated with any images. If you right click one of these titles, you can manually set the cover. There is a way to automatically download covers, but it doesn't appear to be working right now. Maybe when you watch this in the future, it will be. Go to Tools, then Cover Downloader. What you need to do is paste a URL into this. I found this URL on a Reddit thread. I'll copy and paste it in, then check Use Serial File Names. Click Start, and it will download. Except right now it doesn't seem to do anything on the Mac, so maybe in the future it will. Setting manual covers does still work. Now let's talk about our final topic, and that is cheats. DuckStation allows for GameShark-like cheat codes. Driver has a very infamous driving test at the beginning of the game, and it's very hard to complete. Using cheat codes, we can skip this annoyance. Let's launch the game and click Cheats. You'll see a warning about enabling cheat codes, and we can safely ignore that and click Enable. Now that they're enabled, let's click the Cheats menu again. Select Cheat Manager. We will see a huge menu of cheats, but I'm going to quickly ignore most of these and then only check the have all tests complete. I'm also going to scroll down and enable the 60 frames per second hack. Now when I launch the driving test, it'll automatically complete. There's one feature we really haven't talked about and that's save states. And this kind of ties into cheat codes. Save states are exactly what they sound like. These are a way to save the game at any point. Most emulators feature save states. If you click power down, you'll see this message. Are you sure you want to shut down the virtual machine? And you'll see that save state for resume is checked. Let's hit yes. Now when I go to launch the game, you'll see a resume save state was found and it'll show us the date when it was. Let's just click load state. The game immediately resumes to where I left off, skipping the full game boot in the process. You will also notice load state and save state are located in the toolbar. If we click save state, we can create a new save state in one of our 10 slots. Let's do that, and then let's start loading a new mission. If I go to load state, I can see my save state and resume back to where I was. Now to tie this back to cheat codes. If you enable a bunch of cheats and resume a save state, it may cause erratic behavior. As a general rule, it's best to reboot a title if you modify your cheats by enabling or disabling them. 
All right, that's been quite the info dump, and we covered quite a bit of ground. If you're looking for tutorials on the PlayStation 2 or PlayStation 3 or even Xbox, I've made videos about those. Links are in the description. I'd like to thank all my wonderful Patreon supporters as they keep me from doing obnoxious things like sticking mid-roll ads into a tutorial like this. Thanks again, guys.